Have we been teaching the wrong method of biblical interpretation? The dominant method for teaching the Bible in theological colleges is historical criticism. This is a difficult question for me to ask since I'm a biblical scholar trained in historical criticism, so it feels a little heretical for me in my field to ask that question. Historical criticism is sort of an item of faith within the United Church too, so it feels a little heretical within my own church. This is uh, Julius Wellhausen. He popularized the documentary hypothesis, JEDP, source criticism, which many of you will have learned as students in theological schools. Historical hi criticism holds that in order to interpret the biblical text, we should be as objective and neutral as possible in our reading. Exegesis, not eisegesis. The meaning of the text is the meaning that the author intended or in the case of the Bible where we don't know who many of the authors were, at least what the original audiences would have understood. And in order to get at that, we study the vocabulary, the grammar in the original language, and the historical and literary context. The problem is that the philosophical assumptions of this method have been largely rejected by philosophers, and literary critics, yet it continues to be taught in theological schools. So this is uh, Hans-Jörg Gadamer, German philosopher, student of Heidegger. In his uh, magnum opus, Truth and Method, he argued that you can't get to the meaning of a text and an understanding by being objective and neutral. That you have to risk your own experience, your own ideas, your own prejudices. Uh, and allow them to be engaged by the text. You have to bring presuppositions to a text in order for it to have meaning and to gain an understanding of it. So actually, there only is eisegesis. The real question is just whether you're aware of what you're bringing to the text and whether you're open to having that challenged by the text. In terms of literary criticism, in the uh, 40s to 60s in the United States, new criticism developed. T.S. Eliot, a, a primary exam, a, example, they argued that the meaning of a text is not what the author intended. The meaning of the text is to be found within the text itself and examining that text. So they rejected historical criticism. Also, there the rise in the 60s and onwards of many other types of literary criticism. Um, I've used just one example here, feminist post-colonial criticism, which basically showed that the historical critical method was not a neutral and objective method, that either inherently or by the way it was used, it was patriarchal and colonial. Biblical scholars have long uh, recognized and, and struggled with the problem that historical reading causes for doing theology on the basis of the Bible. This is Johann Philipp Gobbler, a Lutheran theologian. In his inaugural lecture as a professor at the University of Altdorf in 1787, he gave a talk called The Proper Distinction Between Dogmatic and Biblical Theology. So he's often uh, remembered as the founder of biblical theology. In that lecture, he suggested that if we put each biblical book in its historical uh, context and understood what it meant in that context, then we would get a descriptive, as opposed to a normative theological, uh, we'd get a description of the theologies of each book, and those could be put together into a theology of the Bible that would give us a firm foundation to do theology on. Fast forward. This book written in 1970 by, this is Brevard Childs, uh, Hebrew Bible scholar and professor at Yale University, wrote this book, Biblical Theology in Crisis. The biblical theology he was talking about there was uh, what uh, in North America was called the uh, biblical theology movement that arose after the Second World War in the United States and argued that biblical scholars could do historical study and theology of the Bible because the God of the Bible was active in history. Uh, 
these are a couple of major examples of this from G. Ernest Wright and, his, uh, and a volume by his student, God Who Acts, uh, The Mighty Acts of God in History. The problem with this is people part started pointing out, well, if your historical criticism is saying that the Exodus didn't happen, or the Exodus didn't happen the way the Bible says, how does that create a, a foundation for doing uh, theology? And another problem is that not all books in the Bible have to do with history. Uh, so what do you do with them? And that is part of the bigger problem in uh, biblical theology uh, since Gobbler is that once you start putting them in the historical context, you realize that actually there's many different authors at many different times of periods addressing many different issues with many different theologies. So it becomes very difficult to point to any unity in the Bible. The solution that uh, um, Child suggested uh, was what he called canonical criticism. Um, and this is now widely practiced in theological schools. He argued that the way the community of faith down through the ages had edited the canon, the book of approved books in the Bible, is a guide to their theological education. So for instance, Psalm 1 is a wisdom or instruction psalm. So it introduces the book of Psalms as instruction or wisdom of David on how to live a life of faith. On a, on a bigger scale, the whole canon, canon begins with the book of Genesis and ends with the book of Revelation, that is Christian canons. So it's really indicating a Christian story uh, about creation and recreation in Christ that leads to the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation. So this has some similarities to new criticism um, in literary criticism, except unlike new criticism that rejected historical criticism, in uh, most theological schools, it builds on historical criticism and tends to be seen as an addition to, rather than replacing. Also in biblical studies, we've had many feminist, African-American, Hispanic, African, Asian, post-colonial, ecological, Marxist, uh, many other kinds of interpretations. This is uh, one example I've given you. Heron Kim Craig uh, teaches at St. Andrews in uh, Saskatoon. She and Mary Ann Beavis, a New Testament scholar, have done a number of uh, commentaries together And this book, What Does the Bible Say? Um, it, influences the, it, it illustrates both the influences of these uh, perspectives on biblical studies, but also the way that historical criticism remains central. So they do these things, and it's also cultural criticism because they put the Bible in conversation with uh, movies, so that's uh, cultural criticism, uh, but still uh, historical criticism remains central, and within the theological curriculum, it would remain uh, central. Um, the problem for me with um, historical criticism, as someone who's concerned about climate change, is that it doesn't tell me or give me a way of critically analyzing how the Bible actually functions in society. I want to know how, not what the Bible meant back there, but how it can inspire, mobilize to action, transform communities today, which was part of what traditional rhetoric used to do, but has been forgotten in contemporary literary criticism. And I do love these methods because they're starting to move in that direction, at least, of helping us understand how the Bible can inspire and mobilize people today. This is uh, Dale Martin. He's an Episcopal priest, a New Testament scholar, and professor of religious study, emeritus professor of religious studies at uh, Yale University. A number of years ago, he got funding um, to go across the United States and visit major theological schools, both conservative and liberal, to, to ask faculty and students about how they understood the interpretation of the Bible. What he discovered was that biblical scholars thought that they were providing uh, something that the other departments could build on, uh, but the other departments didn't find that at all. In fact, he heard uh, stories of theologians giving creative interpretations of the Bible in class, uh, and either students who had taken biblical studies saying, you can't interpret the Bible that way, or actual colleagues in Bible saying, you can't interpret the Bible that way. His proposal uh, here is that um, in a postmodern era, we need to get back to some of the pre-modern 
methods of interpretation, allegorical and spiritual, and begin again reading through, uh, reading the Bible through the Christian story, that that's what gives the Bible uh, unity for us as Christians. Um, so I'm suggesting that we need to recover theological interpretation of the Bible. I'll just go th quickly through the last slide since my time's running out. He's done a follow-up book where he, as a New Testament scholar, puts this into uh, uh, practice. Next slide. Also, uh, in a similar vein, Robert Fennell, originally from Winnipeg, now teaching at Atlantic School of Theology. In this book, argues that uh, the church needs to recover reading through the rule of faith, by which he indicates the things that Christians have believed uh, widely through the, through the ages. So similar to Martin. I'm really interested, uh, you are the uh, people on the ground, the practitioners of faith formation and using the Bible in that. So I'm interested in hearing about what you actually do in terms of biblical interpretation. So I hope you'll be uh, in touch with me. Um, and in that regard, next, next slide. Um, I am also planning a conference on biblical interpretation a year from now at the University of Winnipeg. This is a little plug for the, uh, the conference. Dale Martin, Heron Kim Craig, Rob Fennell. So some of the people there you uh, see there. But we will be discussing um, what is the future of uh, biblical interpretation in theological education. And I hope you'll be in touch with me either to help in the formation of that and talk about what you do or to attend and take part in the conversations. Thank you. I don't know the exact dates yet. It's really hard. So it will be in May, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, so I'm saying be in touch with me and I'll keep you informed. <laughs>